Hey everyone, and welcome to my talk for Crypto 2020 on Fiat Shamir for repeated squaring with applications to PPAD hardness and VDFs. I'm Alex, this is joint work with Vinod, and our paper is publicly available on ePrint at the link on the slide. Uh, the talk is going to be about Fiat Shamir, so let's start by defining it. So the Fiat Shamir transform is a heuristic mechanism for converting public coin interactive protocols for some task into a non-interactive protocol for the same task. So in more detail, we start with an interactive protocol between a prover and verifier, as on the left, and we assume that every verifier message, all these betas, are uniformly random strings. Fiat Shamir then converts this into a non-interactive protocol uh, in the following way. The prover and verifier both have access to some publicly computable hash function h, and the prover is going to use h to generate an entire transcript for the interactive protocol in one message. And the way that this can be done is by iteratively computing a prover message alpha i, and then computing the response beta i to be hash of all of the messages so far. And so this will allow the prover to generate an entire transcript. The verifier can compute all of these same hashes itself, and then check whether the overall transcripts that the alphas indicate, along with the hash function, uh, would be accepting. And if so, the verifier for the non-interactive protocol will accept. So syntactically, this makes sense. But it's unclear whether the soundness of the protocol is preserved by this transformation. So the, the question is whether it's still difficult for the prover of the non-interactive protocol to come up with a proof of a false statement that the verifier will accept. That's the question. So the, the question of whether Fiat Shamir is sound. Uh, and despite the fact that this transformation has been ubiquitous in cryptography for decades, on the theory side, relatively little is known, actually, about the security of this transformation. So on the one hand, we know that if you model the hash function as a random oracle, you can show in fairly high generality that the transformation is sound. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also known that there are strong counterexamples to doing this in the standard model. So there are some interactive protocols, such that no matter what efficiently computable hash function or family of hash functions you use for Fiat Shamir, the resulting non-interactive protocol will be unsound. So this is a setting where random oracles and real hash functions seem to be really different. So given this, uh, in more detail, the question is, for which protocols can we actually instantiate Fiat Shamir using an actual hash function? And what assumption do you need to make about the hash function that's sufficient to guarantee the soundness of the Fiat Shamir protocol? So for quite a long time, basically nothing or very little was known about this question on the theory side. But over the last few years, there's been a sequence of works that finally began to make some progress on this question. And, and this talk is about one of these works. So let me walk you all through the state of the art on Fiat Shamir before this paper. So we knew that Fiat Shamir could be provably instantiated in the following situations. So first of all, we always restrict ourselves for, for the rest of this talk to the setting where the interactive protocol is statistically sound. So we assume that the interactive protocol is sound against unbounded cheating provers. Uh, more, so subject to this and subject to the number of rounds and being not too large, it's actually known that under a sufficiently strong assumption about the hash function, uh, Fiat Shamir will be sound. Uh, it's not a standard assumption. It's an incredibly strong assumption that you really don't want to make. But theoretically, Fiat Shamir could be sound. This, this is evidence on the theory side for that fact. Uh, second of all, uh, in some later works, we were able to show that for a very special class of interactive proofs, you can actually show that Fiat Shamir is sound for a particular hash function family under standard cryptographic assumptions, in this case, LWE. And then finally, there is an intermediate case in the state of the art, a, a, a class of protocols which is not quite so narrow as the second line, but it's not nearly as broad as the first line, uh, where under a slightly weaker assumption than the general result, you can show soundness. And the, the assumption for the third line is still very strong, but it, it's in some sense or morally falsifiable uh, as opposed to the first line, which is an assumption which is not efficiently checkable. So that's the state of the art. Um, a little bit more on why the first and third lines are making non-standard assumptions. The kind of assumption they have to make is, is what's called an optimal hardness assumption, which says that there's some search problem that you can't efficiently solve much better than brute force. And this is, is very far from the kind of assumptions that we're used to making in crypto. So one barrier, an important barrier, 
uh, in this state of the art was being able to do fiat shamir for a succinct interactive proof. That is, some interactive proof whose communication complexity is logarithmic in the amount of time t it takes to decide the language. Uh, uh, again, or we're thinking about just proofs for deterministic computation in that case. Uh, but yeah, so we don't know how to com how to do fiat shamir for any succinct interactive proof as of this state of the art. And this is very related, it turns out, to questions of p-pad hardness. We'll, we'll, we'll see later why this is the case. So we'll be focusing on the second line of results uh, in this talk, and we'll be extending it uh, beyond what was known before, and in particular to some interactive, so some succinct interactive proof. So in this talk, we'll be talking about the problem of iterated squaring. So let me define that as well. So the iterated squaring problem is is, the, is a problem in which you're given an RSA modulus, so you're given a number n, which is a product of two primes, you don't know the factorization. Uh, you're given some group element in z n star, and some number of iterations t, and you want to square the group element g t times. So you want to compute g to the 2 to the t mod n, which can be done by doing t iterated squares. So there is a hard problem based on, based on iterated squaring, namely, it's believed that it takes at least that it takes very close to time t to solve this problem, uh, and in fact, it's it's a it, there's a stronger claim, which is that even if you give your adversary a large amount of parallelism, it's still believed to to require about sequential time t, even given super polynomial parallelism. So this is the hard problem underlying the RSW time lock puzzle. And we're going to be interested in a protocol for this language, the, the language of g comma h, given this fixed modulus n. So as I just said, we're now going to think about making this problem verifiable. So instead of just computing g to the 2 to the t, we want to think about computing this answer along with a proof that this group element h is actually g to the 2 to the t. And so Pieterzak gave a succinct interactive proof for this computation a couple of years ago. And so we're interested in, in compiling this protocol. So let me quickly describe to you how the protocol works. So here we have the prover and verifier. Uh, so what the prover does, the prover is going to run in time t, and the verifier is going to hopefully run in time log t. That's, the, that's what we want. So first, the prover computes the half waypoint of the computation going from g to h. So h is t iterated squarings of g. So the prover first computes t over 2 iterated squarings of g and sends this midway point to the verifier. So this group element u is implicitly making two claims. One is that u is actually g to the 2 to the t over 2. And second, that h is u to the 2 to the t over 2. That, that's the claim that u is the midway point between g and h. So, so this message u generates two claims about iterated squarings of size t over 2 that the verifier wants to be convinced of. But instead of asking the prover to prove both of these claims, uh, the verifier does a random 2 to 1 self-reduction. So the verifier picks a random r, thinking of r as an exponent. And then the prover and verifier, given this r, can compute a random combination of the two claims that I just said. Uh, so we get a new group element g prime, which is u times g to the r, and answer h prime, which is h times u to the r. And now the prover is supposed to show that h prime is equal to g prime to the 2 to the t over 2. So this, this gives you a recursion. And so after log depth of this recursion, we'll get to a trivial statement that the verifier can check on its own. So it turns out that this protocol can be made very efficient. So the prover, it turns out, has to do very little work beyond just computing the answer. Uh, and the verifier is working in time poly log t and, 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 the group, and log the group size. So this is great. Uh, I haven't explained why this is sound, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about it later when we're talking about Fiat Shamir. But this is the protocol. So uh, when this was originally written down, Pieter Zach said, well, we can take this interactive protocol and at least heuristically make it non-interactive using a random oracle by applying Fiat Shamir. So in this work, uh, right. uh, so what that means is instead of sampling r at random, the prover can compute r to be a hash of all of the relevant information in each of these reduction steps. So in this work, we're asking whether we can do this compi compilation in the standard model, not just using a random oracle. 
So now let me tell you our results. The, the, the short answer is you can. Um, so what we show is that if the learning with errors problem, LWE, is sufficiently hard, then Fiat Shamir for this protocol can be instantiated. And we have a few quantitative variants of the result. So first of all, if LWE is 2 to the minus n to the 1 minus epsilon hard, so in other words, it's a strong sub-exponential assumption about LWE, then you can do Fiat Shamir for this protocol where the verifier runs in time 2 to the security parameter to the epsilon. So some small sub-exponential time verification under a strong sub-exponential assumption. Uh, in general, there's a quantitative trade-off. So under stronger LWE assumptions, you can get faster verification. Um, but I just want to emphasize that all of the assumptions being made in all of these results are much, much, much weaker than the optimal security assumption that was implicit in, 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 the, uh, in some of the prior work. So even the strongest assumption we make here, this Q to the minus like 0.001 n hardness, is, uh, is, way less, is way weaker than the optimal hardness assumption, which is more like a Q to the minus n assumption. In particular, all of the LWE assumptions that we make in this work actually follow from worst case hardness via the worst case to average case reduction. Um, but the first of these results, I think, is the most illustrative. So under a strong sub-exponential assumption, you can get a, com a compiler with small sub-exponential verification time. And, uh, so the, the point of these, of these stronger assumptions is to get a larger gap between the amount of time it takes to compute, namely t, and the amount of time it takes to verify. But all of them have a, have a large gap. So from, from this Fiat Shamir compiler, we get two cool applications. So let me quickly walk you through them. So first of all, we get a verifiable delay function in the standard model. Uh, I don't want to get into the technical definitions, but a verifiable delay function is a proof of sequential work, so a way to prove that you've done some amount of work sequentially, with a unique output, namely that's why it's a function, and with close to optimal efficiency, which means that uh, the amount of time it takes to generate the proof is, uh, is very close to the amount of time that the verifier is convinced that you've uh, worked for. So this is very nice. Uh, the primitive that was introduced recently uh, inspired by some like many applications in sort of large-scale publicly verifiable protocols, think like blockchain as an example. Um, and so what Pieter Zak said when he wrote down the protocol that I just showed you is that if you can do Fiat Shamir for that interactive proof, then you get a verifiable delay function. So you get one in the random Oracle model. So that's the first consequence that's going to come out of our work. The second is about hardness in the complexity class PPAT. This is based on some really cool works from last year. So PPAD is a complexity class that captures the hardness of finding Nash equilibria in game theory. And it's known, based on works from last year, that if repeated squaring is a hard problem, and you can do Fiat Shamir for the protocol I just described in the standard model, then you get hardness of PPAD on average. So just plugging those two applications into our Fiat Shamir results, we get that if repeated squaring and LWE are both sub-exponentially hard, squaring slightly sub-exponentially hard and LWE very sub-exponentially hard, then you get hardness in the complexity class PPAD. And second of all, we get VDFs in the standard model with some small sub-exponential evaluation time from the first of our results and, uh, and even less evaluation time under the stronger LWE assumption. Uh, and it's a VDF, assuming that squaring is also sequentially hard, which of course you need to, to have a delay. So what I like about these results is that we're making, you know, in the LWE case, maybe somewhat strong, but still sub-exponential time assumptions about two well-studied problems and getting these Fiat Shamir compilers. It's closer to the stand, like it's a, it's closer to the second category of Fiat Shamir results that I showed you before instead of the first and the third. And from these assumptions, we get a succinct non-interactive argument for a very non-trivial language, in particular, a language that enables these two cool applications. So just uh, before I get into the result anymore, let me just quickly show you what was known, uh, what is known about PPAD hardness based on cryptography. So there are three results worth mentioning. One is that we know PPAD is hard under obfuscation-like assumptions. That was the first result we knew about PPAD hardness based on cryptography. And uh, second of all, there, there's this line of work from last year that's Fiat Shamir for certain succinct interactive proofs is enough uh, to get PPAD hardness. Uh, but 
last year we didn't have any concrete instanti or any instantiations based on standard assumptions of this of this approach. And then uh, and then concurrent to this paper, uh, Kalai, Panap, and Yang gave a different construction of a hard PPAD instance based on a falsifiable assumption on bilinear maps. And you can see Lisa giving a talk on this work in the same conference. OK, so those are the results. So for the rest of the talk, I just want to uh, go over a bit about how we proved the results. So here's the overview of the rest of the talk. I'll first describe the general paradigm that we know for provably instantiating fiat in the standard model. This is based on one of the works from last year. Uh, we'll then see why the methodology as of last year wasn't enough to compile this protocol that we're talking about in this paper, what the, what the problem was. And then I'll show you how to extend the paradigm for compiling, for, for doing Fiat Shamir, uh, beyond what we could do last year, and in particular enough like how to capture the protocol that we're trying to compile today. So the main tool for compiling Fiat Shamir in the standard model are, is correlation and tractability, which is a security property of a hash function originally introduced actually for negative results in cryptography. Um, but uh, in our restricted setting, we say that a hash function family H is correlation and tractable for a function F. If it's hard to find F correlations in the hash function, that is, it's hard to find an input X such that hash of X equals F of X. So as of last year, we know how to construct correlation and tractable hash functions for all efficiently computable functions f, or uh, more, uh, more accurately, for every time bound t, we can write down a hash function family, which is correlation and tractable for time t computable functions, where the evaluation time for the hash function is about t. And uh, this, uh, this t dependence is important and sort of explains why some of the previous attempts to do these uh, p-pad hardness results were, weren't able to work. Uh, so now let's see how these hash functions are useful for fiat -shamir. So let's think about, just for a second, compiling three message protocols using a correlation and tractable hash function. I claim that for some interactive proofs, for some for a certain class of interactive proofs, the security property on the previous slide should be enough, should be a, enough to guarantee the soundness of the non-interactive protocol. So we start with this protocol with messages alpha, beta, gamma. And in the non-interactive version, beta, instead of being sampled at random, is instead hash of alpha and possibly x as well. So we'd like to argue that this protocol is sound. So here's, here's how we do it. Let's assume that the three message protocol has a strong soundness property, namely that for every false statement and every first message the prover could send, there is at most one challenge beta such that the prover has any way of cheating, such that there exists a third message gamma that would make the verifier accept. So many protocols, of course, don't satisfy such a strong soundness property, but some protocols do. So I claim that in this case, uh, correlation and tractability for functions is enough to compile the protocol. And so, so here's why. So if this soundness property holds, we can define a function f, which maps the false statement x and a first message alpha to this one bad challenge that would enable the prover to cheat. We can define this function. And then I claim that if the hash function family is correlation and tractable for this function f, then the resulting non-interactive protocol is sound. And this just sort of falls out immediately or uh, syntactically. Uh, if the prover is successfully cheating for the non-interactive protocol, then in particular, the prover has produced an accepting transcript alpha, beta, gamma. But the assumption is that for every false x and first message alpha, there is only one beta such that this is possible at all. And so it must mean that the hash value beta is also equal to this function value f of x comma. So this is the paradigm for doing fiat uh, It shows that correlation and tractability for functions is enough to compile certain protocols. Uh, but there's a big problem with what I've said so far, which is that for essentially any interesting protocol, any protocol at all, doing anything not, uh, not silly, the function f is actually going to be hard to compute, not easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to take super polynomial time to compute f. And uh, in some sense, like you should expect this. If, if, if f were easy to compute, it means the verifier could somehow already know what challenges were good or bad, and, and then interaction wouldn't be necessary anyway. So, so this is bad, and the workaround so far, the way that we actually accomplished anything, was by supposing or, or constructing protocols where f might be hard to compute in reality, 
but it's easy to compute in our heads in the security proof using a trapdoor, a trapdoor that the verifier in particular doesn't have access to. So that's how we got interesting results before. And already what we're going to be using in this work is that you get an interesting compiled protocol as long as it's easier to compute f using the trapdoor than it is to decide the language. As long as that's the case, you might have super polynomial time verification using, using the hash function, but it'll be less than the time it takes to decide the language, and therefore it'll be a non-trivial protocol. You know, in the end, we're going to have small sub-exponential time verification, as it turns out. So let's try to apply this now, this paradigm, to Peter Zak's protocol. So there are, there are two problems uh, with what I just said. One is that Peter Zak's protocol is not three messages. It's actually a you know, logarithmic number of messages, so it's not clear uh, how to adapt, first of all. And second of all, you know, if we can, if we can phrase the soundness of this protocol in terms of a bad challenge function, we then need to come up with it, an efficient representation of the function so that we can use correlation and tractability for efficient functions. So the first of these problems is something that has been thought about before, and there is a, a way for handling it. There's a way to assign a bad challenge function to Peter Zak's protocol, even though it's not three messages. And the idea is that you're going to have, or rather, you're going to have one bad challenge function for each reduction step sequentially. So, you know, here's one reduction step as I described it. And the soundness analysis is going to say that if the statement is false, that is, if H is not the correct answer, then no matter what first message the prover sends, there's going to be at most one choice of second message R making the recursive call uh, on a true statement instead of on a false statement. You know? So if the recursive call was made to a false statement, then you could keep going and say everything is fine. Uh, the, the argument is going to be that it's rare to ever go from a false statement to a true statement. As long as you stay on a false statement, then at the end the verifier will reject. Okay, so that's, that's good. And so this will give us a bad challenge function for each, each round reduction. Okay, so, so that's good. Uh, and as I just said, uh, this, this statement will give us a bad challenge function for each reduction step. And so again, based on what I just said, if we can come up with a hash function, which is correlation intractable for this bad challenge function, then we'll get soundness of the resulting non-interactive protocol and, and we're, we're done. Okay, so, so that's all well and good. The, uh, the real question is, you know, can we show that F is in some sense efficiently computable, perhaps given some trapdoor? So, so let's see, you know, what, what is this function f? Uh, so I'll spare you, spare you the details. So it, it's, it turns out that if you think about things in terms of discrete logs instead of the group elements, that the bad challenge function r, the, the bad challenge r associated to the statement and first message u, is the solution to a linear equation in the exponents of the group where the coefficients of the equation are where uh, the coefficients of the equation depend on these discrete logarithms. So you know, this is the linear equation. Don't, don't worry about it too much. Um, but let me at least argue to you guys that, uh, that this is not easy to compute, even given the trapdoor. So how, how, would you, how would you find this bad challenge r? So it's a linear equation in the exponent. So what you could do is compute the coefficients and then solve the equation. So to do that, you need to do the following things. You need to compute the uh, order of the group, which is this phi of n. Uh, that's as hard as factoring n, but this is not really a problem because if you have the factorization of n as a trapdoor, then this is easy. So that, that's fine. Uh, we can then we then want to compute these coefficients of the linear equation. So one of these is uh, is easy to compute given again the factorization. But we also need to compute these discrete logarithms, the discrete logarithm of of uh, in particular, the discrete logarithm of u in base g uh, is an important one. Um, and this seems very difficult. u is something the prover produces. You can't just pre-process this discrete logarithm away. Uh, and moreover, the factorization of n doesn't seem to help in computing this discrete logarithm at all. Like The problem of whether groups have trapdoors for computing discrete log is well studied, and we have no, like, there's no indication that this is the case. It, it appears that discrete logarithms are hard given given trapdoors as well. Uh, so this is bad. Uh, we're, we're currently stuck. Uh, the, the approach that I've described so far can't capture bad challenge functions, which require computing discrete logarithms in hard discrete log groups. And so our, our solution in this paper 
is that it might be the case that f is really hard to compute, but we still get something if it's easy to compute with some small probability. That is, we're going to compute f via a randomized, fast randomized algorithm that works with inverse sub-exponential non-trivial probability. So it turns out that discrete logarithms can be computed efficiently in this model. So I'm sweeping some details under the rug, but roughly, but there's some pre-processing that also needs to be done. But roughly speaking, you can compute discrete logs in small sub-exponential time with large inverse sub-exponential probability. Uh, and there are other trade-offs, and each of these trade-offs ends up giving us a different theorem statement. So this is just the standard index calculus algorithm, but it's uh, with different parameter choices, so that you know, the discrete log is not actually computed exactly. Um, so, so this is the fact that we're going to use to get a fiat Shamir compiler. And the idea is that if the hash function family is very quantitatively correlation intractable, that is correlation intractable even against small probability adversaries, then uh, that is if it's, if, it's, if it's that CI for efficient functions, then it should also be correlation intractable for inefficient functions that you can compute efficiently with small probability. So this f in particular will get correlation intractability for this f, even though it's hard to compute, uh, by appealing to a sufficiently quantitatively strong form of correlation intractability. So this follows from a fairly simple lemma, which says that if you're some epsilon correlation intractable for efficient functions, and f is computable efficiently with probability epsilon, then the hash family will also be correlation intractable for f. The reduction is, or the proof is exactly as you would expect. The point is that if you're breaking correlation intractability for f, then you'll also break correlation intractability for this efficient function g with some small probability. So this idea is enough, that this high-level idea is enough in the end to get us the result we want. So let me just sketch the overall analysis. Uh, as I said before, for each reduction step, if the, if the current claim is false, then no matter what the prover sends as its next message, there is at most one response r that that will make the next claim accidentally true. So as long as we can avoid these, then, then we have soundness. So we, this allows us to define a bad challenge function for this reduction step. And if we have correlation intractability for this function f, then we get soundness of the whole protocol. And by what, what, what I just argued, if you have a quantitatively stronger form of correlation intractability for sub-exponentially efficient functions, then you also get plain correlation intractability for this function f, which gives us soundness of the whole protocol. So this is why we need to make a 2 to the minus lambda to the 0.99, say, assumption about LWE in order to get a fiat Shamir compiler for this protocol. So that's, that's our main result. Uh, let me just recap what we just saw. So in this work, we extend the bad challenge function paradigm for fiat Shamir to protocols that cannot be characterized by efficiently computable bad challenge functions. They're characterized by bad challenge functions that are not efficient. Uh, and the way we do it is by considering uh, a model in which the bad challenge function is efficiently computable. And the model is you know, that you only have to be able to compute the function with sub -exponential, inverse sub-exponential probability. And it turns out that this is that uh, reasonable sub-exponential assumptions on the hash function are still enough to guarantee fiat Shamir soundness in this case. And the punchline is that we get these two cool applications, p-pad hardness and verifiable delay function in the standard model, from sub-exponential hardness of two well-studied problems. Uh, so just you know, one, one takeaway that you might want to get from this paper is that you can now do fiat Shamir for protocols that are characterized by bad challenge functions that are efficient modulo some discrete log computations that are, of course, inefficient. And this says you can you can replace these computations by low success probability efficient algorithms and then argue fiat Shamir sounds. Uh, thanks for listening.